So a quick note about this video before I get started is that this video will respond to certain tweets made about the BBC Two program King Arthur's Britain, which was about Britain during the period that King Arthur is said to have lived, so the Dark Ages. And this is a response to the ideas and opinions put forward about the history in these tweets. This isn't a personal attack on the people who made the tweets or an attempt to belittle them or laugh at them um, or anything like that. It's simply to look at the ideas put forward and to look at the historical period rather than having any kind of political agenda against them. So this tweet really sparked it off, which says, King Arthur's Britain on BBC Two, and again, Celts airbrushed out. In this episode, or this program, sorry, they are described as British, not Britons, occasionally native Britons, but the other people are Anglo-Saxons, not New Britons, aversion to Celt slash Celtic always puzzling. So I found this a bit of a strange tweet when I read it, and it uh, was actually shared by a good friend of mine, by Jordan, who had his own response to it, and I thought, why not go into this in a bit more detail? So this uh, TV program was about an hour long, was mostly about the archaeological discoveries on Tintagel, which, if you didn't know, is an island off the coast of Cornwall in the very southwest of England. And Tintagel, for a very long time, was the seat of power of one of the longest-lasting Celtic kingdoms, especially in England, called Dumnonia, which is now Cornwall. So a lot of it was about that, and of course this video being about King Arthur, the kind of mythic historical figure of King Arthur, featured lots and lots of people who would fall under the bracket of Celt or being Celtic, and I'm going to talk a bit more about those words and terms in this video. So by the tweet I'm then assuming that he didn't mean they were airbrushed out as in they didn't mention the Celts because well, pretty much most of the uh, BBC's program was actually about the Celts and various Celtic peoples, etc. So I think it's more with the terminology that uh, the MP Angus McNeil had an issue. So the term Celt, as we have it in English, is a word that I try to avoid in my videos for various reasons. Now let's have a look at the etymology of the word Celt. It actually comes from the Greek word Keltoi. And this word was applied, uh, in a sense, to people who were foreign to the Greeks. Now, there's the great Greek word, which uh, is the etymology behind the word barbarian, which is that they said that people who were foreign to them, who didn't speak a classical language, so not one of the, the Mediterranean peoples, spoke a language, and when they talked, they sounded like they were going bar, 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 bar. And this is where you get the, the word barbarian. Now, Keltoi was a word that they employed kind of generically for foreigners to the north. So in their case, these would potentially be Celtic peoples, but they didn't you know, obviously they didn't have this kind of idea of what we have of the modern idea of the word Celt belonging to a certain group. You probably conjures up images of uh, warriors with red hair and droopy moustaches charging into battle naked with blue paint, nice swords and ovular shields, that kind of thing. But they generally employed it for the people to the north who were foreign to them rather than being a certain uh, ethnic group or cultural group or even linguistic group. They were just the foreigners. That kind of thing. Now another one is Galli, which comes from the Latin, it's the Roman word, and it's ultimately where we get the name for Gaul from. We're not entirely sure what the precise etymology of that is, but I think it's there's a fair case to say that it probably came from uh, the, the Celtic languages themselves, because there's a very similar word, which is Gael, which is still used um, by many Irish speakers today. Now there is a couple etymologies for this, and also you have the fact that Gael actually initially meant foreigner, and still in, in Irish, in the Irish manuscripts for example, the various people, uh, the Vikings who came over to Ireland, were classified into two different groups by a lot of the manuscript. The Finn Gael, who are the light foreigners, they are generally seen to be the Norwegians, and the Du Gael, who are the black foreigners, and no this isn't an... Uh, some kind of African conspiracy theory video, they, those are the Danish who came because they had darker hair. So do is uh, black in Irish, and that's why they call them black. But it, initially it meant foreigner, so it's kind of weird that they are named after foreigner, but that's where I think there's a connection. So those are several words for various Celtic peoples. There's Gael, there's also another word uh, for specifically the Irish uh, Celts, if I can call them that, which is uh, Guadelic, which is also a linguistic term. And it's in linguistics that I'm going to continue with this, uh, which is quite important here. Because for a long time, the population of uh, Britain spoke a language which we assume was common Britonic, or Brythonic, it's sometimes spelt. 
Now, after the Anglo-Saxons came, they kind of cut a swathe through the centre of England, uh, which is obviously named after them. It's Angloland, it's the land of the Angles. And this separated the land of common uh, Brythonic speakers, which then separated into various forms like Old Welsh, West Welsh, and Cumbric. If you're interested, I, have, I do go into this in more detail in my video about the Henogledd, which is the Old Norse, the um, kind of Celtic Brythonic part of England that remained for a long time culturally and linguistically Celtic and was independent from the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. So how does this relate to the video? Well, um, he obviously goes on to say there's aversion to Celts and Celtic. Well, really, by saying Celt, it's a very broad term. Now remember it comes from the Greek and they used it for foreigners. Now today obviously the connotation is different. It's not just anyone who isn't Greek isn't automatically a Celt. But you do have a huge swathe of peoples who would fall under the term Celt, whereas in the BBC's programme they're much more specific because they're not talking about people from Gaul, you know, they're not talking about people from Anatolia in Turkey, you know, the Celts also went there. They're not even talking about the Irish. So the term Celtic I avoid in my videos because I prefer to be more specific. It's like, uh, for example, if I were to describe the like a, a Roman general as Julius Caesar. If I was to say that Julius Caesar was a Mediterranean conqueror, why would I do that when I could be more specific by calling him a Roman conqueror? So it doesn't particularly make sense to do that. It's also that they don't call the Anglo-Saxons Germanics because they can be more specific. They can be more specific by calling them Anglo-Saxons, which is uh, still, still a blanket term. Obviously, it's made up of two terms, and there were probably many tribes who came to Britain who were Germanic. Uh, I always go on about the Frisians, for example, but that's just another title that we give to another loose grouping who probably called themselves something completely different uh, who came to Britain during this time. And really, of course, they don't, they don't mean all the Celtic groups, so that's why I don't think they call them Celts, because you can be a lot more specific. Now, if we look at the languages as well, for example, all of these are the remaining languages or, or um, some of the, the kind of linguistic history behind the Celtic languages that are still here. The Insular Celtic is the language family of the Celtic uh, language groups that came to the British Isles. Insular is like a fancy way of saying island. So you have on the one branch, you have the Guadalic Celtic, which is known as Q Celtic. And from Old Irish, the language in uh, Ireland, that developed into Middle Irish and then Modern Irish uh, in Ireland itself, as well as going over to the Isle of Man, which is in between Ireland and England, where it developed into Manx, and then having Scottish Gaelic, uh, in the parts of Scotland where they spoke it, so the Highlands, parts of the Lowlands and the Isles. Whereas then you have another grouping within the Insular Celtic language, which is Brythonic. And of course I mentioned the common Brythonic language, which is the ancestor of that. This grouping is known as P-Celtic. And then you have the division of the various parts where the uh, Britons, and that is the term I would use to describe them, Britons, speakers of the Brythonic language or Brythonic language, uh, where, they reside, where they resided, um, is where they spoke these languages developing into modern Welsh, uh, modern Cornish and Breton. The Bretons actually probably having fled from Britain over the sea to the area of Brittany, which is in modern France. It's a sea arm that sticks out, probably because of the Anglo-Saxon invasions uh, or because they had a chance to uh, cross over the sea there into Brittany. Because the Breton language, while it's on continental France, isn't a direct descendant of co the continental Celtic languages, which died out sometime probably the 5th century AD is where they died out. They were probably replaced um, initially by Volga Latin when the Romans came, and then after that by the Frankish language, uh, Germanic language in certain parts, and then uh, into the, the kind of early incarnations of the what would become the French language, or the various French languages, that kind of thing, which were Romance languages. Um, obviously the, uh, say, the descendants of Volga Latin in the various parts of the empire after it collapsed. That was quite a big tangent there. Um, so, also with Celtic, sometimes it's said that it's like an, an ethnic thing. Um, but you can see just on the latest study, which they actually used in the documentary, the BBC documentary about King Arthur's Britain, you can see the various Celtic parts. So if you look at Ireland, you can see there are various, um, obviously, groups there. 
If you look at the uh, Scotland, which is often seen as Celtic, you can see there are many different groups there. If you look at Cornwall, even, you can see there are two, three, maybe four groups even down there, as well as Wales being divided. So there's not one Celtic gene, if that makes sense either. So it's, it's hard to even classify them as an ethnic group, which is why it's best to avoid Celtic as a term like that as well, because, well, it doesn't really exist in that sense, it's more cultural. Now the suggestion to call the Anglo-Saxons New Britons seems really foolish to me, um, because, well, they're not, they're the Anglo-Saxons, they're the forefathers of the English, that's where we get the term English from. Um, and honestly, you, we, we tend to call the, the Celts of Britain, at least on the island of Britain, the Britons, um, because it makes it a lot simpler, to be honest. As well, another point to illustrate is that, as I mentioned earlier, the term Celt can be used to describe people from uh, the Isles of um, Scotland right down to the south of Ireland to the ones that were living in France or Gaul to the north of Spain, right through to Cisalp and Gaul in the north of Italy, uh, the Balkan, and northern Turkey. And really, do you think that these peoples, if we use the term Celt, are going to have more in common with each other or with the groups that happen to be living next door to them? Like, it would be very difficult, I think, to distinguish, let's say, on the border of the tribes of the Frisi um, in the modern-day Netherlands, whether they would be a Celtic group and the Cherusky who lived very close to them would be a Germanic group. Like, I think that distinction would be very hard to find, possibly only linguistically, which I think is probably the best application of the term Celtic, and is where you use Celtic in an official term is with the languages, because they are called the Celtic languages. That's how they've come down. It's also, again, as I was saying, with being more specific by calling them the British and the Britons. It's like you could say a football team, that's like the Celts, because obviously you have so many different tribes and peoples who fall under the bracket of Celts, Whereas if you say Arsenal, you're being very specific, you mention a particular team, and with calling them the Britons, I think you do that, you're much more accurate, because they don't mean uh, all the other Celtic groups, they don't mean in the documentary, even the other Celtic groups from, um, oh and yes, I'm going to say it, the Irish people are going to cringe, the British Isles, the islands around uh, the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, um, you know, they don't mean the ones from the island of Ireland who came over. Uh, who settled in places like uh, Wales and, uh, more famously, Scotland and the Isle of Man, bringing their language with them. They don't mean those people, they mean the Britons of uh, the original inhabitants of the places of England who were uh, displaced, intermingled with, uh, murdered, a combination of all three by the Anglo-Saxons. And these people would fall into their own categories, into their own peoples. These are some of the uh, groups that I mentioned in my video about the Henogleth. You have the Godothin, you have the Kingdom of Strathclyde, you have Hreged, uh, you have Elmet, uh, and various uh, Welsh kingdoms which remained, like Gwenedd and Penguin, this kind of thing. And then you also have the Picts, who are uh, potentially slightly different to the Britons. We're not entirely sure, they're a bit more mysterious. But also, as I mentioned, the Irish coming over a different uh, Celtic group that came over with a different language and, and really a, a different uh, heritage and culture. They hadn't had that mingling with the Romans that the Britons had had by the time the Anglo-Saxons came over. Now as well, there was uh, some more tweeting, which I thought I would mention here. Uh, one by Tom Holland, who I'm quite a big fan of. Uh, he said, it's because the word Celts was never applied in antiquity to the inhabitants of Britain. People first started doing so in the 18th century. So um, what they referred to these people as was some form of Britain uh, in, in both sort of the older Celtic languages um, as well. The Anglo-Saxons generally refer to them as Walish, which means foreigner in their language. Again, like Gael is the term uh, for foreigner. And the Celts themselves would refer to themselves, for example, the Welsh refer to each other as the Cymru, uh, which is where Cymru comes from, which is um, obviously the name for Wales, and this means kinsman rather than anything else, so that's how they referred to sort of each other, some form of that, it's believed in Cumbric they had a similar term to this. Um, whereas of course this introduction was in the 18th century when people were looking back at uh, Greek uh, writings and things where they came across the word Keltoi um, and started using that again, they didn't use it at the time. The Anglo-Saxons using the word Walish, uh, which is obviously where we get the modern term Welsh from. Uh, it's interesting as well, whenever the there is a border between where the Germanic tribes uh, and came across a foreigner, you get a term like Walish. So for example, in England you have the border 
obviously with where you had a Germanic culture and then on the other side you had uh, a, a kind of Celtic British culture, you have the Welsh in Wales. In the um, in Belgium now, you have where the Germanic, probably the Frisians, were their southern extent. And then on the other side of that border, you have the Wallonians in Wallonia. Again, from the same root, because these were a foreign people to the Germanic tribes. And also, I believe somewhere in the Alps, you have uh, some a similar etymology there, which is quite an interesting point. However, he did get a reply. Uh, again, this isn't a personal attack on the Pickwick account. It's, it's looking at what he said, or she... Um, the vast majority of the Arthur tales came out of Celtic-speaking slash culturally Celtic areas rather than Britonic-speaking areas. Um, obviously, Britonic is a Celtic language. Feels like Collins using technical correctness to give casual viewers the impression the Arthur story is more British, brackets English, than it is. Um, to which I responded in the fray by making an IT crowd meme because obviously Britonic uh, is Celtic and is the Celtic uh, language that was spoken, the common Britonic, on Great Britain for such a long time. The fact that he says English or uh, British brackets English is very much confusing in this point because by British in this the Dark Age context, you mean Brythonic speakers. So the Celtic populations of uh, Great Britain, the island of Great Britain. English is coming from uh, Anglish. These are the Angles, the Anglican. So these are the Germanic people who came in. Of course, the first name for England in Old English was Anglaland, the land of the Angles. So when you say English in this context, in a, in a um, Dark Age context for uh, Great Britain, you mean the Anglo-Saxons who came over, the Germanic speakers of Old English, which obviously is where we get modern English and these terms from. So you don't want to be confusing British, which is used for the Celtic peoples, and English, which is used for the Germanic peoples, despite the fact that today, in a non-Dark Age context, you might be using those words for completely different things. So, and uh, I saw a lot on Twitter as well of people being very annoyed that it was like a, a little Englander kind of uh, conspiracy, whatever, trying to rub the Celtic peoples out and all of this. I think there was a lot of hate for it. Um, I did actually disagree with the conclusion which they drew from this series, and I usually do. I find generally the BBC does quite interesting uh, documentaries and things about this period. But then when they get to the end, I find that the experts who were really quite good, and I don't want to belittle them at all, um, I've actually met one of them, Max Adams. He's a really nice guy, and I thought he was great throughout um, this program. But then some of some of the others towards the end of these BBC documentaries, they make some outrageous claims based on very little evidence. And I'm actually going to be making a response to that why... I disagreed with the conclusions that they came up with in this. But anyway, I feel like I've rambled on. This has been a really random video, but I thought I'd uh, look into some of the etymologies for some of the words, have a bit of a ramble, and also I'll have a, a proper video up this Friday. So don't worry, this is, uh, I feel like this doesn't warrant to be the video of the week. But yeah, I'm trying to upload every Friday. So if you are uh, a big fan of the channel, then Fridays is when you want to tune in and when I will have something extra to say that week. Uh, or I just fancied giving you guys another video, I'll upload one on Wednesdays. So thank you very much for watching. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, and tune in again next time when I'll talk about some more history and languages and stuff like that. Feel free to uh, join in with anything in the comment section below. And if you'd like to keep up with me responding to other people about historical stuff that's going on then give me a follow on twitter because i do that quite a lot for better or for worse so thanks for watching i'll uh, see you all soon see ya